if you remain standing. Please turn your Bibles to John chapter 6, and I'll be reading from verses 48 through 59 this morning. John chapter 6, verse 48 through 59. Hear now God's holy word. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on, that, on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Well, it's great to be here with you this, uh, this morning, uh, a couple of weeks away from the official start of fall, uh, just loving what's uh, happening outside in nature. The temperature I heard is going to get hot again this week, but uh, my favorite time of the year is coming in a couple of weeks, so hopefully you can enjoy that. Also, well, we were going uh, last month a little bit of hiatus from uh, the Gospel of John, our series there, dating back a couple years now. But we're now back in chapter six. It's a lengthy chapter, uh, but full of reassuring words of Jesus on his own identity and then our own identity in him. And so, in the beginning, if you remember, because we were doing this all summer, in the chapter, in the in chapter six, he started, started off with feeding the 5,000. It was his greatest largest miracle uh, in feeding the 5,000. But of course, the crowds didn't just want to leave it at that, and they followed him back over the Sea of Galilee and chased him back to his ministry headquarters in Capernaum. Because what? Because they wanted this miracle bread every day. Was it because they wanted to follow him and worship him and say, you truly are the Son of God, the Son of Man? No. They were saying, make this happen all the time. We are desperate. We don't want just a once-in-a-lifetime meal. We want this every day. Then Jesus had to explain to them with the first of his seven I am statements when he said, I am the bread of life, of course, repeated here in verse 48. What else happened in chapter 6? Jesus compared himself to Moses, that actually he is the greater Moses who has now come, not someone to simply move God's people from geographical location in the exodus, but a spiritual exodus of God's people, from slavery to sin to now gospel freedom in Jesus. This is the spiritual exodus that he has come to inaugurate, and that the manna that was provided could only help them physically in Moses' day, but the true bread of life was meant to be given for spiritual life for eternity. Of course, most of the crowds didn't like this type of teaching. Like many of us, when we pray, we often are so focused on getting an end result, like the miracle bread, for instance, that all the while missing to remember who God is and focusing on who he desires to change us while teaching us from his word, for his purposes, for his kingdom matters. We get so focused on the here and now, and God, you need to answer what I think is my greatest need right now. But then Jesus goes on with this beautiful passage teaching us that he and the Father are one, that he, Jesus, only does what the Father wills. If you remember in verse 39, he says, and this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. We are reveling in that verse in July. How could this be true? And we believe this to be true that if the Father has called us out for his purposes and his glory, that Jesus will never lose any of us who believe in him. We should have full confidence then that if we believe in him and place our trust in him, he will be our eternal God. 
And so he concluded where we left off in, in July, at the end of July, in verse 47, a theme that he'll continue in today's passage. John 6, 47, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. And so this chapter has taken us a couple months to get through, but I think it's so worth taking our time carefully to dig deeper into Jesus' words. When I was preparing the sermon this past week, it dawned on me, you know, I think a lot of people hear, oh, we're going through the, the Gospel of John, and if you've grown up in the church or have been at a church for, for many decades, you say, okay, here's the same stories over and over again. But John is more than just the parables and more than just the, the miracles and the, and the grand stories. But John is so full of rich theology and doctrine to hold, not just in our minds, but to let that sink into the hearts of who Jesus really is and how we are to respond to his greatness. And before we go on, let's pray again for this time. Father, we ask that you would illumine your holy word by the power of your Holy Spirit, that for any of us with hardened hearts or clogged ears, would come to you afresh, would come to you and be helped and aided in our helplessness to not only hear, uh, but to love your word, uh, to cherish it, to apply it in all categories and aspects of our lives. We cannot do that without you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In youth group in Virginia, I don't know why I still remember this, because it was like 60 years ago, and our youth group pastor would, at the beginning, I think he had two volunteers. I'm not going to do that to you. I don't usually do props. But one student held a piece of yarn from one side of the wall, and then the other student took the yarn and went to the other side of the wall. And he said, you young people here, think too much about the small speck of your daily living. And we we're like, well, what is he talking about? He was like, just imagine that this yarn spread off from wall to wall and then going in the other direction for an infinite amount of time that we can't even really comprehend. Look at that as eternity. But then let's go to the very end of the piece of the yarn and you see that one little speck, that's you. That's your time in this short period on earth. And then the rest of eternity goes way, way beyond. Simple illustration, simple prop. As a ninth grader, I was so touched and moved by that. Even at a young age, I still, in my 40s now, never, never forgot that. And it reminds us that this is the tact that Jesus had also in preaching and teaching to the crowds that were following him, always about eternal life, eternal life, eternal life. Why are you so focused on manna? Why are you so focused on the 24 hours ahead or the next week or month or your retirement or those saving up for retirement? You are so obsessed with that that you're forgetting that you are just one speck, one speck of all the vastness of eternity. And so he says again in verse 48, after talking about eternal life, you're going to hear this repeated throughout this passage. I am the bread of life. Verse 49, your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, and here it is again, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. You know, a couple of Old Testament allusions come immediately. Let's wondering if you're kind of tracking the same way come immediately to mind as we read these uh, few verses here. One, of course, that Jesus already mentions, here hearkening back to the days of the Exodus and the wandering in the wilderness of the Israelites, where they grumbled to Moses because of their hunger. So Yahweh, what did he do? He provided manna miraculously to feed the people, to sustain them for that day. And then Jesus identifies himself as the bread of life, not to sustain someone physically for a day, in contrast to the wilderness, but true bread sent from heaven that if received in faith, meaning believing in Jesus as Lord and Savior, they will never grow spiritually hungry or thirsty again. He's talking about this earlier in chapter 6. This is a bread that will never perish, but actually grants not just a temporary sustenance, but everlasting life. And of course, most in the wilderness did eventually die in the wilderness. 
And so that manna wasn't salvific in nature for eternity. But he says, if you eat of the true bread, figuratively, of course, that is Jesus, you will not perish. You will not die. But then this brings me to the second illusion that I was thinking about from the Old Testament. And that's all the way back. You don't have to turn there in the Garden of Eden at the beginning of Genesis. In chapter 3, the serpent is trying to deceive Adam and Eve and ask Eve in Genesis 3.1. I'm just going to read a couple of verses. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Now, of course, we're talking about a spiritual death. Yes, in the fall, mankind's days on earth are numbered. There will be death, our final enemy, the scriptures say. But the sin that Adam and Eve committed was this rebellious mistrust of God, to not believe in his word. And so the Genesis account had this prohibition of eating, so that one would not die. And here we have Jesus saying a reverse condition, you should eat the bread of life so that you will not die and live forever. I bring this up because friends, you better believe Satan is still active in our world today. He didn't just say, my job is done in Genesis three. I can go on and just kind of see what happens and unfolds. No, even today, Satan, is trying to tempt mankind to question it again. Did Jesus really say you'll die if you don't eat the, the true bread from heaven? Is that really true? Can you really put all your confidence in what he's saying? It's the same old tricks. It's the same old deception. Are you sure? Can't you just stay in the place of desiring the very appealing alternatives of this world? Can't you just say, if you were a Jew, let's say, in Jesus' day, fall back to the traditions of the old covenant. Seek only physical manna and wholly disregard Jesus as a supposed one true bread of life. I mean, you've probably heard the quote that, that Satan just knows his Bible back and front more than any of us here. And a lot of the falsities that comes out of his mouth are probably true. It's that last percentage is that want us to start doubting and to thinking, well, did I get that exegesis wrong? Or did I really read that right? Do I really have to eat of this bread of life? No, the enemy didn't stop in the Garden of Eden. He wants all of us to consider other options about quote unquote, preventing final death or spiritual death. And his offerings, I'm sure, are enticing to so many to turn away from the living God, the living bread, ultimately in the end. I'm not saying Jesus had this connection in mind when saying this, but I thought the allusion to how the enemy twists God's word to persuade us to not believe in God's word was a very important way of application. The direct application then is, believe and follow what Jesus said of himself. Eat of the living bread so that we are not left in spiritual death, but transferred, yes, into everlasting life. Now then, allow me to focus our attention on one important phrase here. Really, it's a really important word, actually, in this phrase in verse 51, if you can turn and, and pay attention to that verse. I'm just going to read that uh, verse there. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The phrase and focus is for the life of the world. A very well-known scholar noted that for him, the most important word in the Bible is the Greek word huper. It's spelled uh, hyper in English, but the Greek word huper. And then that word is translated here in this verse as for, or you can translate it as on behalf of. Why was the most important word in the Bible for him huper? Because he says this word essentially encapsulates what Christ has done for us on our behalf in the gospel. The for us or on behalf of us is what is amazing about the grace found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
that although we were objects of wrath and deserving eternal judgment and hell, yes, now the Christ had come to live and die, who pair for us or on behalf of us so that we may live. Nothing we could do on our behalf, nothing we could do for ourselves to be forgiven and saved is possible. And only what Jesus has done who pair for us in his perfect life, death, and resurrection. This is the crux of the gospel. The great exchange happens when we trust, when we're enabled to believe in Jesus as Messiah. That Jesus received the punishment we deserved because of our record of sin. And then the exchange is we get the atonement, the forgiveness, his perfect record of righteousness. And then, yes, as Jesus is emphasizing in chapter 6, everlasting life. Instead, it wasn't just, Rob, it enjoy the next 40, 50, 60, 70 years of forgiveness and union with me. But then when you die, that's done. It's over. No, receive forgiveness and the perfect record of righteousness of Jesus for eternity, almost unfathomable to think about. And not just to live forgiven of our sins in this lifetime, but for eternity, purified. Think about this, cleansed, promised to be with our Lord forever. Some of, you, some of us, we play that game, like we look back at the last week or the month and we just say, oh, it's, it's, it's pretty much kind of walking in a pretty worthy manner. But then the next day comes, you're like, I'm probably going to ruin this streak really quickly if I'm depending on my own righteousness or quote-unquote righteous works. There is no anxiety in heaven. There is no fear anymore. There is no temptation to say, have I done enough for you? There's no doubting to say, oh, what if I sin in eternity? No. That's all removed in the gospel and promise to us. Because there is no gospel without Jesus, as he is emphasizing all throughout John. There is no gospel without the concept of who pair, that Christ came for us so that the world, that the world can live. Now, as we noted several times in our series in John, what does John mean by world, that everyone will eventually be saved? No, that's not what he means by to save the world. No world for John in the gospel and even in his epistles is meant that people all across the world from different tribes and groups and tongue that believe in this Jesus will not perish but have everlasting life. I mean, that even in itself is mind-boggling for those Jews in, in uh, first century AD because it's all about the Jews. It's all about Israel. But Jesus is saying this is for the world, for Gentiles and Jews alike, who if they just believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And the Apostle John includes this as a repeated refrain in his gospel because it's a repeated refrain in the teachings of Jesus. This is what is good news. I don't know why I wrote here few, P-H-E-W, because I think that's what I was feeling when I was writing this. Whew. I don't know if you need that moment here this morning to just say, this is just not religious news. This is actually good. Whew. This is good for my soul. Whenever you're backed up against the wall with the struggles of life and the depressing nature of your own sinfulness and inadequacies, you say, thanks be to God that we can recognize the sweet balm of Cooper. We respond to the world, to the enemy, to our own condemning sinful nature with, but Jesus came to do all of this on behalf of, for me. Galatians 2.20, probably my favorite verse in the Bible. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself, and here's the exact Greek word again, who gave himself, who pair, for me. 
But the Jews are still hard-hearted. They can't see this. They can't understand. They said in verse 52, the Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? This was grotesque for them. Just as we referenced before, Nicodemus, even his disciples have a hard time interpreting what Jesus taught. They, they took it so literally. How can a man, Nicodemus said, be born again, literally? How can we feast and eat of the bread of life if you're saying that's you? Is he going to literally tear off an arm so that we can eat? They immediately go to all of these thoughts. Look at verse 53 through 54. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Jesus, if I could say it this way, he doubles down on these last verses. Eat the flesh of the Son of Man, the Messiah, and drink his blood. If you don't do this, you have no life in you, but if you do this, you'll have eternal life. And the addition here is you'll be raised up by the Son of Man, Jesus himself, when he returns. There's a lot to unpack here, not just for the intellectually curious, but for good interpretive meaning for what Jesus is trying to convey. If taken literally, Christians become cannibals, man-eaters. Jews are saying, look, Jesus, I think you know Leviticus. We are forbidden to drink any blood. We are forbidden to eat any meat that still has blood in it. And you're saying, eat of your flesh and drink of your blood. Actually, there's evidence from the Roman, uh, Roman Empire era during the early church, pagans would call Christians cannibals. We have historical record of them talking about this. These Christians are crazy. They're cannibals because they, kept, they keep talking about partaking in the flesh and the blood of Jesus. And they just thought that was so confusing and curious. Sure, there was, I've learned, lots of propaganda back then by the Roman Empire to warn people away from this new religion. But we can understand how people not of the faith being very confused about this teaching. And I would understand if you were reading this, though, for the first time, if your mind went directly to, oh, this must be why we do communion, why we observe the Lord's Supper, the body and the blood. But I agree with a Reformed author and PCA pastor, Rick Phillips, and others that discuss the many logical reasons why Jesus is not referring to the Lord's Supper here. I'll just give you a couple of reasons that this is at least a year before Jesus institutes the actual sacrament of the Lord's Supper. So nobody would understand what he's talking about here in that regard. But also, if Jesus is saying all along in the Gospels, you need to believe in him, in faith, to be saved, why would he then pivot in chapter 6 to say, actually, in order to have eternal life, you need to take communion? What happens then to those who die? What happens then to those who die before taking the Lord's Supper or even the other instituted sacrament to be baptized? Surely we all agree here: we are not saved by the sacraments, but through faith alone, by grace alone, in Christ alone. But again, I understand if your mind went, "Oh, this is you know, this is probably why we're doing the Lord's Supper today." That was actually not even intentional. Actually, in Roman Catholicism, as historians note. They claim that they use the passage, this passage in chapter 6 as one of their main reasonings for their view of transubstantiation. Transubstantiation. It's that Roman Catholic view that the bread and wine are literally transformed into the body and blood of Christ during communion. I'm not trying to make fun of this tradition, but when I was in high school, I was going with my friend who invited me to his mass um, and I went, and he, you know, he did all the, the signage, and I was very, it was very intimidating for me. I was, a, I was just a young little Baptist boy, and I was like, what is going on? And then in this kind of compartment, laced in gold, they placed the elements in there, and they closed the door. And my friend Andy, I can't even remember, I remembered his name, but his name was Andy. And he said, Robin, this is when it becomes actually the body of Christ and the blood of Jesus. And I was freaked out. I was like, whoa, we don't do this at the Baptist church. And, and I was just kind of sweating. I didn't know if I was going to participate. I don't even remember if I did. But that was such a weird kind of notion for me. But they take this literally from John chapter 6. 
As Protestant churches, we of course do not believe in the interpretation of transubstantiation altogether. But we believe instead a spiritual feeding of Christ who is literally and bodily at the right hand of the Father, that we feed on Christ spiritually through the sacrament to be nourished in our union with him. But again, if this is not in reference to the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, what is he actually regarding here? And I think this is actually fascinating, and it fits so well in the context of chapter 6, and that's why we need to read any verse or any paragraph in the context of the larger whole. As one theologian points out, Jesus is trying to convey to this mostly Jewish audience that he himself is the true Passover lamb. And this is in the context of feeding then on him. This makes actually total sense because Jesus was already referring to the Old Testament allusions and examples. And now, guess what? This was during the time of the Passover festival. This is why crowds were gathering because they were making their journey towards Jerusalem. But now they did a little detour because they were following Jesus, this miracle maker of the manna. So they're in Capernaum. But this is during the time of the festival, the Passover festival. And he's using that to point to himself as a spotless lamb. You know, one scholar simply reminds us, I'll just kind of read this as, as a summary. For some of you guys, it might be a little foggy in remembering this, but the Passover feast, what was it for? It was a festival remembering God delivering Israel from Egypt when God sent the angel of death to slay the firstborn of Egypt. Only God's people were spared. Why? Or how? By sacrificing a lamb spreading its blood on doorposts and that the angel of death would pass over their house. And so the Passover meal consisted of eating the sacrificial lamb. This was, of course, done as a part of a festival and feast once a year. It was very important in their tradition. Let's now gather, remember, commemorate our freedom, our exodus, God's deliverance, Let's sacrifice a lamb again in remembering, and together let's eat the lamb. This is the, a vital theme in John's gospel. We remember John uh, the, the Baptist is, is witness to Jesus all the way back in chapter 129. Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And this commentator said this is how Jesus meant the Jews to understand eating his flesh. This is Jesus, as he normally did, pointing eventually to his own sacrificial death on the cross. He is speaking to the eager but confused crowds. Look, if you want eternal life, eat of his flesh and blood. Not literally, but spiritually feed on the true Passover lamb who doesn't deliver you from some geographical bondage, but he spiritually frees you through faith from the bondage of sin, from the bondage to Satan to experience the freedom found only in the Son of Man, the Lamb of God himself, Jesus. He is the one who will be sacrificed. This once and for all act will be on his cross, his shed blood and broken body for the forgiveness of sin and the salvation of those who believe. He's saying you don't have to sacrifice a lamb every year again and again and again. He has done, he has done this once and for all. So feed on the lamb. Feed on the true bread of life. Believe and live. And then he goes on further. Look at verse 55. For my flesh is true food and my body is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. He is saying, accept no imitation to the audience 2,000 years ago to 2024. Accept no imitation. Even if it's dressed in utter high religion, accept nothing but the true food, the true drink. And that can only come from Jesus. And you're saying, Robin, of course, like this is just elementary kind of news. Of course, Jesus, no. If you just look online at what people are saying about religion and about even Christianity, there are so many falsities and distortions. People saying Jesus is good, but really you need to do this and that or believe in a certain way, this and that way, in order to be 
saved. And Jesus comes back again and again and said, you need to accept true gospel, true food, and the true drink. So many of the crowds wanted to reply on their super spiritual religious uh, rely, rely on their super spiritual religious activities or traditions or observances over the years or during the year. And Jesus is saying, those things cannot save you. Only faith in Jesus can. And don't you see, if you want union to the eternal Son of God, oh, this is a once and for all event when your heart is regenerated, when you feed on Christ in true faith, nothing then can then separate you from Jesus. As he says, you will abide in him and he will abide in you. And this is the encouragement we truly need. Not that everything goes right and well in him, but the true balm we need for everyday encouragement is this, the true food and the true drink to feed on Jesus, the Christ. And so then these last two verses act almost as this perfect inclusio. If you just kind of step back and look at the whole passage an inclusio is just a literary kind of device to say, I'm going to repeat or mirror kind of the front at the end. So verse 48 and then now in these last uh, verses, 58 through 59, they're pretty much almost the same verbiage. It's a little bit of a different order, but the same concept. And people write in that way because they want you to say, hey, this is kind of if, you know, they didn't have emojis or anything like that or an exclamation point to say, you got to really pay attention. But inclusios were the ancient way to say, you need to pay attention to what we're about to say. Really focus in on this. And what a gift of a passage to teach us on believing on Jesus, the bread of life. So he concludes, verse 58, this is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. I just have a couple of quick applications for us. Is number one, I think I've been highlighting it throughout, remember the concept of huper. It's spelled hyper in English, but remember the concept of huper. The next time you're tempted to say, I need to save myself a little bit this day or week, or a month. When was the last time you, cogn you were cognizant of just, just deep sin in you? The first temptation in our old nature is to say, what are you going to do then? What are you going to do to kind of cover this up? What are you going to do to make this right? And it becomes so inward again. Or I need to prove to Jesus this week that I should be kept saved. Or I need to perform a bit more works to tip me then into heaven. That is completely anti-gospel, the opposite of the concept of huper, that we needed, we realized that we needed another. And over our history and, and tradition, we, we call this an alien righteousness, meaning it's not from our own devices, but from the sent one, Jesus the Christ, who for us and on behalf of us allowed us to be adopted as children of God. The life we live now for the Lord and his glory comes out of remembering the huper, truths of the work of Jesus. And so when facing doubt, when you're struggling with sin, when you're feeling like a failure or fully inadequate, will you remember today? Will you remember this week in your struggle, in your time of need, huper? Number two is this, you have to actually eat the bread. If you follow the illustration literally for a second, if you haven't eaten for 40 days, let's just say, guys, I, I want to get healthier and I want to lose 30 pounds, I'm not going to eat for 40 days. You will email me and be like, I don't think you should do this. But let's just say I went through it. I'm starving. And you go to Whole Foods, I don't go there anywhere, it's too expensive. But if you go to Whole Foods and you get this fresh baked bread, and you bring it to my apartment, and I receive it, and I say, the smell, the softness, and I'm just like, thank you so much. And I take it into my apartment, and I hold it, and I cuddle it, <laughs> or I put it on a bookshelf, and I gaze at it. <laughs> and I told you a week later, 
thank you so much. These are all the things I did with the bread, but I, I actually never ate it. You would just slap your forehead. Without eating of the bread, you'll find no nourishment for your body. And in the case of starvation, you will die, actually, eventually, without eating. What am I trying to say? Many people who grew up going to church or even if later in life started getting interested in Christianity, it can't just be gazing at Jesus with admiration. Should we gaze at Jesus with admiration? Yes. But it can't just be feeling emotionally safe talking about Jesus. It can't just be going through the motions of religion either. You actually have to feed on the bread of life. Meaning you, yes, actually have to place your whole trust and faith in him alone. And as one author said, well, nobody can eat for you. Not your spiritual mentor, not your family or mom or dad. For those new to coming to church or for those younger here growing up in the church, you have to believe in faith yourself. And if you don't think you can just do that yet, pray, even now. God, can I, can I feed on you? Not just through the faith of my mom or dad or my grandmother or grandfather who just prays for me all the time or might drag me to church every once in a while on a Sunday. Because God is the only one who can make your heart believe. When I was working with college students many years ago, I was shocked to find so many confess to me, Robin, I think this is the first time I'm actually wanting to believe in Jesus. And I said, what do you mean? I, I thought you grew up since age six at the church. And many times, young hearts, young college students would say, I think I was just kind of resting on the faith of my family. Yes, my mom and dad wanted me to believe and they wanted to raise me up in this Christian home, but I never personally trusted in him. I always thought, I'll get through, I'll wing it, I'll go through the motions because of mom and dad's strong faith in Jesus. No, only this can only happen. Eternal life, eternal security, the forgiveness of sins is you personally feeding on Jesus, meaning trusting in him personally to be your Savior and Lord. It just so happens that as we segue now, we are about to partake in the Lord's Supper. What is a sacrament? Why do we do this? The Westminster Confession says a sacrament is a holy ordinance instituted by Christ, wherein by sensible signs, Christ and the benefits of the new covenant are represented, sealed, and applied to believers. This is not about justification or regeneration, but this is about being fueled and nourished and to see all the applications of the gospel given to us. And so as we segue into the Lord's Supper, what we do in communion is not a literal eating of the flesh and drinking of the blood of Jesus, nor again does this participation save us. But what happens when we partake in the Lord's Supper in faith is that in a very real sense, we are spiritually feeding on what we have already professed in our confession of him as our Savior, that he is the one true Savior and Messiah. And he, he was crucified on our, on our behalf, who pair, for the forgiveness of our sins and was raised in victory and glory on the third day. And we proclaim this as Jesus instructed in the Lord's Supper until he returns. So thanks be to God that he has provided us with the once and for all Passover lamb sent from heaven, this bread of life so that all who feed on him shall not perish but be granted by God's grace eternal life. And so if you truly believe in this and on him, let nothing persuade you that you are not welcome to his love and family. I really pray and hope today you will leave embracing, oh yes, this good news of the Lord. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we were reminded in, in that psalm earlier today to taste and see that the Lord is good. Yes, we will remember well in a moment at the Lord's Supper, but also being pointed to from chapter 6 and to this exact passage that Jesus was sent to be that sacrificial lamb, that we are covered and cleansed by his blood. 
that we were redeemed by his final work on the cross. A broken body, shed blood for us on behalf of us so that we can let go of the grip of that chain that said we have to earn or merit anything to be your child. This is good news. So thank you, Lord, for convicting us yet again, even if we know the Gospel of John inside and out. Thank you for allowing our hearts to feed on this word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.